thank you so much for leading in that way. And we come to the time now to hear the word of God. And as always, as we are all preachers here in some measure or another, we look forward to hearing and teaching the Word of God, and I'm, I've been looking forward to this for some time, uh, even before the semester began, thinking about what I might share with you men and those that may be listening now, and I want us to consider uh, God's Word from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll look and consider it. Let me just read it for you, verses 10 and 11. The message is entitled, Serving Your Returning King. Verse 10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking or saying the utterance of of God. Whoever serves as a do so is one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A wonderful text, isn't it? And I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but Um, On at least American football fields, you'll see it. I'm not sure what other sports uh, have this habit, uh, this tradition. You will see men in the fourth quarter raise their fingers. And I did it from my days of playing college football. I remember raising the four fingers was saying, this is the fourth quarter. We have 15 minutes to either maintain our lead or to catch up. And often the coach would tell us that we need to leave it on the field, he would say. So fourth quarter, it began. First quarter is over. Second quarter is done. Halftime, you go in and you debrief and talk about the adjustments that you need to make. And you go back out again, third quarter. Perhaps you tie the game. Perhaps you come from behind. Perhaps you extend your lead. But nonetheless, you would see both teams in the fourth quarter you would see them raise their hands and say, guys, this is it. There's no more time after this. Once that final bell goes off, we can't either come from behind because it's over with. Fourth quarter is over. I did it many times. And there are a lot of times that honestly, if I were to be honest with you, I was saying, what's the point of this? We've been whooped. There's no way we're going to come back. We're down by 52 points. It's not going to happen. (laughs) And there were some other games. I remember some of them. Fourth quarter, we can do it. Come on. Leave it on the field. And you go around and you say to the next guy, leave it on the field. Make sure that you're using your talents, your abilities, your skills so that we can win. Give it your all. And as I was a defensive guy, I'd go around to the guys that was a nose tackle and the tackle and the defensive end and the safeties and the cornerbacks, and it doesn't matter if you don't know what those terms are. It sent you my other teammates and say, come on, guys, leave it on the field. And maybe you'd even go over to the offensive team because they hadn't scored enough points. Come on, guys, leave it on the field. You have the ability. You have the talents. I know you can do it. Get your head in the game and leave nothing behind. Raise our fingers and say that. I think about the Christian life in that way, uh, leaving it all behind. In one sense, I would say that we are in the fourth quarter. The time is near. Jesus Christ is coming again. And the question for us all is, will you leave it on the field? Will you use your talents, your abilities, your gifts to say, God, I gave it my all. And there are times I've seen people play this sport and they literally would collapse once the game was over. I gave it my all. One classic example from a game that was played many years ago, 
um, and he was a tight end for the San Diego Chargers, being taken off the field. He'd exhaustion. He had given his all. And it's amazing how, what people give for sports. I mean, you come together, and I played in some pretty interesting arenas. I remember playing against the Penn State Nittany Lions uh, and playing there in their field. I mean, 85,000 people that are there. And you come into Beaver Stadium and say, we're going to walk away with a win. Well, one time we did and the other time we did not. But you left it on the field. It's interesting that last week, Dr. Zuber, as he was preaching about uh, being careful and learning from excessive ambitions, and really this message is a compliment to that because I didn't know that he was going to preach that, and he didn't know that I was going to preach this, but surely in God's providence, we are here today in one sense so that I can compliment what he's already said about serving and how we serve and why we serve. And my emphasis uh, this morning is on this reality that we serve with a sense of urgency. We all believe and we all know that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. We believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can talk about the church culture today and even say that perhaps church culture needs confronting because we, we live in this age, there's a mindset that would say, what can I gain from the church? What can I hear what sounds will be there, what people will be there, what things will be done for me. And you hear any number of messages or tweets or Facebook posts or whatever one may see about this sort of culture in our church. And we confront it, and, and rightly so. However, you should understand that ministers are not divorced from this mindset. We even were reminded of it last week, even with the disciples themselves right there in this critical moment in the life of Jesus Christ, they're wondering about their own greatness. And they're ministers who fall by the wayside because they have not developed a servant's heart, a heart that says, I'm going to leave it all on the field. I'm going to give myself for the Lord. And if I gain any recognition, so be it. And if I gain none, so be it because I do it unto this king that is returning again. Jesus Christ was that humble servant, and Jesus Christ served with a sense of urgency. And I want to focus on the sense of urgency as we serve him. The Lord Jesus Christ asked you a question, if you were to replicate yourselves, say, a hundred times, and you were to create a congregation, or you were to create a pastoral fraternity, what sort of fraternity might it be? If you looked around and said, let me replicate me. And that's in part what we're doing when we're involved in Christian ministry. A part of us, we're saying, follow me as I follow Christ. We're investing in the lives of men and women and children. And we're saying, follow as I follow. And this text helps us put things in perspective. Now, let, let's set up a bit of the context. I, I want to walk us through even verses 1 through nine, as we get to verses 10 and 11, and we can say that in verses one to six, the example of Christ is calling us to a new life, because in verse one, Christ is suffered in the flesh. Now we should arm ourselves for the same purpose, because now we should cease from sin, no longer live as you formerly lived. And then in verse two, notice this um, issue of time comes up there so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Time. And then in verse 3, time comes up again. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles. That is, and he goes on to list what some of them are. When you pursue sensuality and lust and drunkenness and drunken parties and abominable idolatries, the time for you is over. That door is closed. That stopwatch is ended. Now live the rest of your time, in one sense, this fourth quarter, live it for the Lord Jesus Christ as he is coming back again. And then, in one sense, we see time again. In verse 4, he says, essentially, that those that you used to be with in life now 
they look at you and they malign you because you're no longer living the lifestyle that you used to and that life even indicts them and instead of congratulating you, what do they do? They malign you. They castigate you. They criticize you. But you should expect that because the same was of the Lord Jesus Christ. His life was a light and when he came to the darkness, the darkness did not comprehend it. It ran from it. But notice... Verse 5, but they're going to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So in time, they will be judged. And now we are men who are called to live according to the will of God in verse 6. But then really, the the change in the passage right here in verse 7. So verses 1 to 6, the example of Christ is calling us to this new life. And then in verses 7 through 11, we can say the eschaton of Christ, the coming of Christ, these final things of Christ motivates us in this new life. Notice verse 7, it says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. So this next passage is really hinging on this thought, the end of all things is near. So we're to live appropriately. So Peter says the motivation for what I'm about to say to you in verse 8 and verse 9 and verses 10 and 11 is based on you thinking eschatologically. You should be thinking that here is life. We are in the fourth quarter. Let me live appropriately. Let me live accordingly is what he's saying. There are three words that I want us to consider for a moment. Imminency, and this is what he's talking about, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word is fronted, all things is fronted in the text. All things, it is near. So make sure that we understand this. Now, this word imminency, and actually I want to talk about imminency. I want to talk briefly about imminence. And then I want to talk about imminence. You say, okay. Number one, imminence, imminency. That is, Christ is coming again, and it could happen at any moment. Do we all believe that this morning? At any moment, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the clouds could be opened up. And then there's imminence. That is, he is in our midst as he indwells every believer, and the Spirit is moving about according to his sovereign will as the wind blows. And what is he doing? He is saving. He's regenerating people. He's encouraging the saints. He's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. So there is imminence. He is with us. And then there is imminence, E-M. That is, we think about the imminence of Christ. And even as my title is communicating, serve your returning king, your eminence. I worship you. He is worthy. And so we're to give our lives because we serve the Lord of lords and what, what does it say? King of? You can respond. That's okay. It's quoting the Bible, guys. So, eminency, eminence, eminence. This is the one that we serve the Lord of lords, and King of kings. And this passage here, that is these two verses in 10 and 11, are really a complement to and conclude the thought of chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Turn there. Because really the thought is from chapter 2, 11, all the way through 4, 11, Peter is making an argument. And notice what it says in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly, Lust, which wage war against the soul. And then in verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that, and the thing which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good behavior, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So now we're back again to this sense of time and how we should live and what we should be doing while we're in this fourth quarter. Live appropriately. Verse 5, we've already noted that God is going to judge. Christ, all judgment has been given to him. And so when Peter says the end of all things is near, we can say that the resurrection and ascension of Christ has done what? It has set in order the end times. And this will give believers the total confidence that God's plan is unfolding. 
And as they wait for the return of Jesus Christ, That will accelerate the events of the future. When I say accelerate, I mean that once Christ returns, a specific timetable begins, then we will be closer to the consummation of the ages. Now, it is simply his imminent return, any moment. But once he comes back, then now this timetable is set in order. But then the opportunity for us to minister in this capacity like this is over. Imminency in Peter is important. Look with me at chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Peter. Verse 3, as I already communicated a different way, we can say in verse 3 that the resurrection of Jesus Christ initiates this. Now that he has ascended into heaven, then the disciples were waiting for what? Waiting for him to return again. And they were waiting until their last breath, thinking he might come back again. And sometimes with us, we can become somewhat indifferent because now here we are, 2,000 years removed. And we say, well, perhaps it will be another 100, it will be another 1,000 or another 2,000. It might, but it might be simply another moment. Even as I'm looking at my stopwatch here, making sure that I manage my time as I preach, I'm at 16 minutes, 5 seconds, 16 minutes, 8 seconds, 6 Before you even say it, another second has gone by. It could happen just like that. Notice verse 4. So then salvation is reserved in heaven for us. Verse 5. It's going to be revealed in the last time. Verse 7. Our faith will honor God at the revelation. And notice what it says at the end, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 13, his coming revelation does what? His coming revelation should orient us or at least help us orient us in our life choices. Verse 13, therefore, prepare your minds for action, keep serve sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be revealed to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Think soberly while you're in the fourth quarter. And this is why Peter says in verse 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit. And if you were to go back to 1 Peter chapter 4, you'll notice perhaps even Peter's use of words here. He says, when it comes to prayer, be sober, be sound, but he'd already said earlier, you used to live this way, what? In drunkenness, in abominable idolatries, and in drinking parties, which obviously was the opposite of sound judgment and sobriety. So now don't live that way anymore. Get over it. Live soberly. And sometimes to keep with this sort of image of one being drunk, um, by the grace of God, I never experienced it. Uh, there are other things that I experienced in life that I'm ashamed of, but I never experienced that. Uh, uh, there are guys that I knew and some of the guys on the team that were, they would get drunk after the game and some to console their poor play, but um, nonetheless, it happened. And they'd have a hangover. And, ta- and I just, it just never computed to me, even before I knew the Lord. This is just dumb. I don't, I don't understand it. Why would you go and drink something that's nasty and then lose a sense of your control and then in the morning vomit and have a headache? It just makes no sense to me whatsoever. Even as an unbeliever, I sort of got that. Some people, they come to Christ and they've lived their way in the world and they're still getting over that form of life. And this is in part why Peter says, okay, no longer live that way. This is how you used to live. Now be sober and be sound. And notice what he says, for the purpose of prayer. See, the last things in behavior is a theme, I mean, throughout Scripture. Let me just give you some examples. I, I can't go through them all, but Romans 13. Romans 13, 11 through 14. What does it say there in verse 11? Awaken from sleep. Now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. Verse 12, therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness. Verse 13, let us behave properly as is the day. Verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
A similar thought, of course, is in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. Of course, very familiar, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Philippians 4, 4 through 9, this theme uh, throughout the New Testament that the last times, the fourth quarter, should shape, it should mold, it should affect your present behavior. Because he says in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, in Philippians 4, the Lord is near. And because he's near, behave accordingly. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. We're to stimulate one another to love and good deeds all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're in the fourth quarter. Second Peter, what does he tell us in chapter 3? All of these things are going to be destroyed. So he says then what sort of people ought we to be in our conduct and in godliness hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? Live appropriately. Eminence is important. We think about Peter as a writer and all the experiences that he had and, and ways that perhaps even his, the, seeing the transfiguration may have had some import in how he understands holiness and he writes about holiness. We see Peter as he would see the Lord Jesus Christ and how he dealt with his detractors, those that would castigate him, those that would accuse him. And surely that has some effect when he writes about the Lord Jesus Christ and following in his steps when you go through suffering. As he would see the Lord Jesus Christ shepherd people and care for people and be a man of compassion, this has great impact when he writes chapter 5. Yes. But there's some things in life that I'm sure Peter wanted to do over as well some mistakes that he made, and I think all of us in some measure may want to have a, a redo. Can I do that over again? But the thing about it, once that time comes to the end, that's it, guys. It's over. I mean, we would debrief on a football game. We'd come in Monday and we'd look at the film and we could say, you know, we should have done this and we should have done that. Hargrove, you weren't paying attention here. Or, or this should have happened. You blew the coverage here. Why didn't you go at it with more energy? And once the debrief was over, you could say, wow, we could have won that game. We could have. But guess what? You didn't because the game's over. Once the fourth quarter is over, you cannot go again and reassess and say, well, based on our evaluations and our analytics, actually, we could have won that game. Let's submit it. No, friend, you lost. Move on. And time's going to come for us, guys. It's over with. Life is over. If you're young now, you have energy now, you guys can, you know, stay up till 3 in the morning and wake up at 4.30, and you can move on, and all of a sudden your body begins to change a little bit. I'm not speaking for anyone else except for me right now. My body's changing. Just recently, I'm saying, oh, my knee hurts. It never hurt like that before. And I start to do these things sometimes during the day. It's like called naps, you know? I mean, as a kid, you fought it. I don't want to take a nap. I don't want to take a nap, right? And now it's, I need a nap. <laughs> Sin is, we're dying every day, aren't we? Time is coming to an end. Having said that, in these two verses, I think there are three exhortations <laughs> Three exhortations in these two verses that I pray will really motivate you to serve with all your might, knowing that your king will return again. Remember those four fingers. Number one is this. Serve your returning king responsibly. Serve him responsibly. So Peter has said, the end of all things is near. Then in verse 8, what are you supposed to do? Love sacrificially. Then he says, what are you supposed to do? Be hospitable uh, without complaint that you give generously to others. And then in verse 10, he tells us here that we're to be a people who, are to, who have received a special gift, each one. Now, Peter is obviously addressing spiritual gifts, but he, he doesn't want to, he's not taking Paul's approach to it. 
He's more concerned about the effect that it's going to have in the body of Christ with the churches of Asia Minor as they're facing persecution, which we're familiar with. He's saying, I want to make sure that each of you understands that there is a special gift you have each received. So if we're going to serve our returning king responsibly, we have to recognize God's gift each one has received. And I'm sure that many of you men, because of your experience, you're here in seminary, that um, you have identified your spiritual gifts. But some of you may not. You may not fully know, what are my spiritual gifts? And the way that you can best discover them is through ministry. As you minister those gifts and people will recognize it. And I'm sure that some of you maybe have recognized that you have the gift of teaching. Maybe it's the gift of, of administration. Maybe it's the gift of exhortation. Those gifts have been recognized, and now you are called to use them. And it's also this. When we are going to serve our king responsibly, this is done as we meet God's expectation. Notice in verse 10 as well. So we recognize that each one of us has a gift or our gifts, and then he says, employ it in serving one another. Employ it, just that word. You're to act on it. And in part, you being here in seminary is saying, I want to act on that gift, but I want to do it more comprehensively, more intelligently. I want to be better about using my gifts. So you come here and you develop your skills and all of you in some measure, you have an ability to communicate God's word, but you come and you learn exegesis and you go through hermeneutics and you know historical theology and all the things that you study so that you can exercise that gift better. You can be a better communicator of God's word, a better exhorter of God's people. So employ it, he says to the churches of Asia Minor, don't become passive. It's necessary in the midst of the persecution and difficulty that you're facing that everyone is engaged using their spiritual gifts so that the body of Christ is built up because you will act as a buttress, if you will, against these attacks that are coming from the outside. Now, if we're going to serve our king responsibly, it also means this. This is done as you apply human stewardship, as you apply human stewardship. Notice what it says. So we're to do so employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Stewardship, you hear a great deal about stewardship. Uh, I don't think there is not a time in any meeting um, in my time here at the Master's Seminary, at least full time, that I haven't heard Dr. Murphy talk about stewardship. It it seems to be his phrase, and it's not his phrase alone, but you understand what I'm saying, an emphasis of his, constantly stewardship from the time that I knew him many, many years ago, now a couple decades now, stewardship and using his time, getting up at a certain time in the morning, making sure that he was prepared for his exams, making sure that those exams are done in a timely manner, being a steward. It's been entrusted to you. And what a privilege you have to be a steward of the manifold grace of God. Amen? Absolutely. But what's interesting, too, as well, I think perhaps Peter is very intentional here because he says the manifold grace of God. Because if we go back to chapter 1, verse 6, there he says you are facing manifold or you're facing various trials. So here... In one sense, that's why it's necessary that you be a steward of the manifold grace of God because that will be a defense against the manifold trials that you're facing. So it's necessary that if you're an exhorter, that you exhort. It's necessary if you have a particular gift to serve and to speak that you do it so that the church can face these manifold trials coming upon us in this fourth quarter. And this is what he's saying. And of course, we know that many stories of what our dear brothers and sisters of time past face, whether it be physical violence, whether it be economic oppression, whether it be religious suppression of our faith, they needed one another. And so we are men who are called to be freed slaves for Christ. There is that sort of that oxymoron of our faith that we are freed slaves. And you must be committed while there is time. He's established it. The rest of the time, live this way. Travel with me for a moment, if you will, in history. 
you would have to go back 400 years, August 1619. And if you would go to the shores of Virginia, you would see the first slaves disembarking. History tells us in the African diaspora that perhaps um, 13 million were stolen from their countries and then transported to Europe and the Americas. And along the way in what's called the Middle Passage, uh, one and a half million to 2.5 million died along the way and many others died shortly after arriving. And their bodies would have been discarded in the vast waters of the ocean. And they came here, stolen away, and they faced harsh treatments, often cruel masters of foremen. The families were divided with no hope of returning. In this last year, I've been to Virginia several times. I have two sons that are training right there, right uh, in Virginia, Quantico, Virginia's Marines. And, and I've been up to Charleston as well. And I've been to Charleston. You can walk through that, this part of Charleston. It's a wonderful city full of culture and great food and great things to buy, great commerce. To see. And I've been, and I walked through these streets where people were sold. And now people are getting on their Yelp thinking, what's the best place for crawfish? What's the best place for this? And you think for a moment, people were sold here. And I've been in Virginia and through the beautiful hills of Virginia and the dense forest there. And I've been there when it's 95 degrees and it's 90% humidity. And I'm imagining who survived in this. How did they do it? Enslaved. At times, some even brutalized with no hope of returning home. We are free slaves. We are, according to Luke 17, slaves of Christ. And Luke 17 tells us, familiar passage, right? That we are these unworthy slaves. And ultimately, we should say to this master, we are unworthy slaves and we simply do as we ought. No need for recognition. And as we heard last week, no need to sit on the right or on the left. The very fact that I'm in the kingdom of God is enough in its own, is it not? Some of you, before you knew the Lord Jesus Christ in this very room, you were drunkards. You were fornicators. And some of you, perhaps, even in your thoughts, that you were adulterers. And all of us were idolaters, were we not? But by the grace of God, this king, unlike many evil and even hypocritical slave masters of our country's past, this king is different. He takes us from darkness he provides his own life as a ransom. And he will, at our death, transport every one of us into a place that Peter tells the churches of Asia Minor is reserved for you in heaven. So leave it all in the field in this fourth quarter. Steward your gifts as you honor your returning king. Secondly, it's this. Serve your returning king consciously. Notice verse 11. Verse 11, and we'll call this 11AB, if you will. Notice what it says, the utterances of God and the strength which God supplies. So Peter wanted them to be conscious of two things. And what Peter's doing here when it comes to the gifts, he's, he's in one sense, I believe, divided them simply into two categories. Paul gives us a number of the particulars. Peter simply says, I'm going to think about the gifts in two ways. First, when we speak for God and as we serve for God. And he wants them to understand first the source of their words. They are the utterances of God. And he also wants them to understand the power behind their servants, the strength which God supplies. And this idea first, uh, divine proclamation, if you will. Uh, in Peter, we see the sense of speaking and speech. Go back with me to chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. 
and what's communicated there. But you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of he who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so Peter here, the use of the word, has an emphasis on or focus on the extent of this announcement. Proclaim it widely that others can see and laud and glory in the excellencies of God. Then look at chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 15. Familiar text, and what does he say here? But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense or an apology for everyone who asked you to give an account or to give words for the hope that is in you. But do it with gentleness and with reverence. So again, an apology, speak these words to others. And then in chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus Christ now it says, he went and made proclamation to the spirits and prisons. Now, Caruso, this herald, this preacher, this official announcer. So all of this is involved. Now, when Peter says here in 411, make sure that when you're speaking, I think he's talking about it. you speak to one another by way of counsel or exhortation or rebuke. When you speak the word of God to others in your midst, make sure that you understand these are the very utterances of God. There should be a soberness about it. You know, the core of our seminary's mission is supporting kingdom purposes as we do what? As we train pastors and men who would train pastors. Some of you will go on and you will pastor somewhere and some of you will be a trainer of pastors. You may be as a, as a missionary, perhaps it's in one of our, uh, our TMAI and you will train other men as they train others as well. We are men who are preaching the utterances of God. Someday you may be pastoring a church that's like, not unlike the churches of Asia Minor. And you'll train people to encourage, to exhort, to instruct, and to counsel others in the faith. And what you must do with that is make sure they understand that when they do that, they're speaking the utterances of God. That's what he's communicating. We need men in our country who are going to be bold and sensible, relevant expositors of God's word, but they understand the soberness of the message. Notice what else he says in verse 11. Then whoever serves is to do so, serving by the strength which God supplies. So what week are we now in the seminary? This is four. <laughs> but it's not over, guys. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, this is like 15 quarters. What is going on here? Overtime, 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 overtime. But come around, what is it, November 18th, I think, you can say, ah, I got through it. And how will you get through it? By the strength which God supplies. How will you minister? By the strength which God supplies. How will you not be another statistic and a man that says it's enough, uh, I give up, I ring the bell? You do it by the strength which God supplies. That's how you do it. I mean, this is a theme throughout Scripture. Joshua, be strong and courageous. Ephesians 6 and 10. He says what? Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. What does the scripture tell us? Not by might, right? And not by strength, but by my spirit. The scripture tells us I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The scripture tells us when I'm weak, I am what? I'm strong. It's another oxymoron. That our weakest moments are often our strongest moments. When we rely on the Lord. Uh, travel with me again. I took you back 400 years before. Um, I would take you back not as far. Let's go to Massachusetts. Let's go September 29th, 1770. Sir, you are more fit to go to bed than to preach, said Mr. Clarkson, a friend of evangelist George Whitfield. On that day, Whitford, worn out for many evangelistic tours and suffering from asthma, was headed to Newburyport, Massachusetts, where he was scheduled to preach in the morning. True, sir, answered Whitfield, 
and then he turns his eyes in prayer. And it isn't an interesting that Whitfield would pray, and it isn't an interesting even in 1 Peter, the end of all things is near, be of sound judgment and sober spirit, not first to preach, but for the purpose of prayer. And he turns his eyes to heaven, and, he, and here is his prayer. Listen to this. Lord Jesus, I am weary in thy work, but not of thy work. If I, had, if I have not yet finished my course, let me go and speak for thee once more in the fields. Seal thy truth, and let me come home and die. Well, he set out his plan as he passed through Exeter, a crowd had assembled. They asked him to preach. He's 55 at this time. And as he would often do when he was wearied, he would sit while his friend Reverend Smith would gather the crowd together. It was interesting that just a day earlier, a week earlier, he had written to a friend in London and he said these words, the day of my release will shortly come. There's time again. There's time again. And what happens? He speaks. He was very weak, and they got a large barrel, and they put him in it so he could sort of rest himself in it, if you will. Imagine this sort of being a barrel, and you're sort of resting in it. He stood. It says he was shaking and weak. And it says, I will wait, and here's his prayer, I will wait for the gracious assistance of God. For he will, I am certain, assist me once more to speak in his name. And it said that the crowd looked at him, and it seems as if the Holy Spirit um, in that moment came upon him and strengthened him, and he preached for how long? Here he is, dying. He preached for how long? He couldn't even stand initially. He has to be assisted, and he preached for two hours. Two hours. On the text, test yourselves to see if you be in the faith. And he preached also about going to be with Christ. The story unfolds. He comes back, he's weak. He's given some food, he strengthens himself for a moment, 2 a.m. He wakes up, he's uncomfortable, he's given a bit of comfort. He says this asthma is coming back, 3 a.m. He speaks again. By 6 a.m., his fourth quarter was over. But he did it by God's strength. Whitfield left it on the field. My last point is this. Serve your returning king worshipfully. I'll edit. Here is the whole of our life. It's to serve the Lord Jesus Christ to his glory and to his honor. And notice what it says. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory of and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God is glorified through Christ, and honor is given to Christ. If you don't do it by God's strength, you will burn out. And what's interesting, on Whitfield's dying bed, he said this, as his friend told him, I wish that you would not preach so much. And Whitfield says, I would rather wear out than rust out. Amen? It's not, some people talk about burnout. No, it's not burnout. It's your body gives way. Jesus Christ is the example. He left it on the field. Uh, just a moment. Turn with me, please. I, I want to end with this thought. If our ultimate purpose is to live for the glory of God, then our ultimate example is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to read some text for you to show that Jesus Christ left it on the field, if you will. He is the ultimate example. Throughout the epistle, Christ, follow Christ in Christ's steps. He has suffered in the flesh. Now you suffer, but don't involve yourself in sin. Mark 14. The Son of Man, what, in chapter 10, came to serve and not be served and to give his life a ransom for many. I'm just going to read through these, the intensity. Verse 41, 
of chapter 14. The Son of Man is being betrayed. 42, the one who betrays me is at hand. 44, who was betraying him? And then they seized him. 45, and, and then he came up and he kissed him, and they laid hands on him, and they seized him. 56, it says that they were false testimonies against him. 64, they condemned him. And what did they do? They blindfolded him and beat him and received him with blows in the face. Chapter 15, then they were binding him and led him away and delivered him, and they questioned him, and again they questioned him. Chapter 15, verse 13, they shouted back, crucify him. Again, crucify him. And then they scourged him, and they handed him over to be crucified. 16, the soldiers took him, and then they dressed him, and they put on him. Verse 19, they kept beating his head, and they were spitting on him, and they were kneeling and bowing before him. Verse 20, and they mocked him, and they led him out to crucify him. Verse 22, and then they brought him, and they gave him wine, and they crucified him. In the description above him, there was a charge against him. And in 29, they were hurling abuse at him. And in 31, they were mocking him. And in 32, they were insulting him. And he breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. On this earth, his fourth quarter ended. And what did he tell his disciples who would follow him? Uh, what is he telling us? We know later in chapter 16, he says, go. 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 Serve your returning king. Verse 